This lecture describes how the Federal Reserve implements monetary policy. And as a reminder, the views expressed in this presentation are not the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, the Federal Reserve Board, or the Federal Reserve System. To understand how monetary policy is conducted currently, we need to take a trip back in time, just a few years, be it to uh, 2008. If you remember a little bit about 2008, you'll likely recall that we were in the midst of a global financial crisis. So stresses in the financial system built up gradually over 2007 and 2008. As mortgage troubles and recession fears increased, the stock market peaked around mid-2007 and fell through 2008. And then there was the housing market. After rising rapidly for nearly a decade, housing prices peaked nationally in the summer of 2006 and then fell rapidly. And since much of the wealth of households is composed of the stock market assets and the value of their home, most Americans suffered a large decrease in household wealth. 2008 was also the year that the Fed stopped using its old toolbox, which relied on open market operations, the discount rate, and reserve requirements to influence the federal funds rate. Now, there's a pretty good chance that your textbook still has these tools listed as the Fed's toolbox. And so uh, part of the point of this presentation and this course is to introduce you to the way the Fed currently does monetary policy. So before we jump into the new toolbox, here's a quick review of the old toolbox. Prior to 2008, the Fed was operating with limited reserves in the banking system. In that framework, the Fed's tools worked like this. The federal funds rate was determined in the federal funds market. Like other markets, the rate was determined by supply and demand. The graph here shows the federal funds rate at the intersection of supply and demand. Reserve requirements created a steady demand for reserves and kept the demand curve downward sloping. It eventually flattened out because at some point, banks don't need any more reserves for payments or additional cushion. Because banks shouldn't be willing to pay a higher rate than the discount rate for funds, the discount rate acted as a ceiling for the federal funds rate. As such, on the graph, the demand curve is capped by the discount rate. Then there's the supply curve. The Fed controlled the total supply of reserves and the Fed influences the supply using open market operations. For example, when the Fed wanted to lower the federal funds rate, it would do an open market purchase of government securities that shifted the supply curve to the right as the Fed credited the account of the seller of the security. Graphically, a relatively small rightward shift of the supply curve would result in a lower federal funds rate. Because reserves were limited, the supply curve intersected the downward sloping portion of the demand curve. The Fed could fine tune the federal funds rate using very small adjustments of the supply of, the, of reserves or that supply curve. It made these adjustments daily to keep the federal funds rate near the target set by the Federal Open Market Committee. But then something changed. When the great financial crisis hit the economy, the outlook was bleak. Remember, stresses in the financial system built up as mortgage troubles and recession fears increased. The FOMC responded by lowering the target for the federal funds rate and then implemented a number of emergency programs that stabilized the economy. The FOMC conducted a series of large-scale asset purchase programs, also known as quantitative easing, that pushed down interest rates and eased financial conditions broadly to support the economy. When the Fed purchased these securities, it paid for them by crediting banks' reserve accounts at the Fed. As the figure shows, reserve balances rose from under $20 billion to over $2.8 trillion. So how could the Fed increase the federal funds rate when the recession ended? The figure on the left is the limited reserves regime the Fed used before the financial crisis. As I mentioned before, to move the federal funds rate, the Fed increased or decreased the supply of reserves by a small amount, and that influenced the level of the federal funds rate. If they wanted to raise the rate, the Fed reduced the supply a little bit using open market operations to sell securities, which shifts the supply curve to the left. Now, in December 2015, we looked like the right figure. With a superabundant level of reserves in the banking system, $2.8 trillion, the supply curve intersects demand where it is zero. Banks are satiated with reserves. They don't need any more funds to make payments or have additional cushion. Now, small changes in the supply of reserves don't have any influence on the level of the federal funds rate. At that point, the Fed decided it was time to turn to new tools. This slide presents, in a nutshell, 
the way the Fed lifted off from the zero lower bound with a large supply of reserves in the banking system. The framework is called an ample reserves regime. This is because the supply of reserves was large enough so that small movements in supply don't affect the federal funds rate. At liftoff in December of 2015 and today, the Fed relies on its administered interest rates to encourage market rates to move higher or lower. The green arrows point to the Fed's three administered rates. These are tools the Fed uses today. The blue arrow represents the role of open market operations, which the Fed uses occasionally to ensure reserves remain ample. Let's take a closer look at each one. Before we get into the details, this slide lists the tools and the administered rates. Uh, so on the left side, you see the four tools, uh, interest on reserve balances, overnight reverse repurchase agreement facility, the discount window, and open market operations. Uh, the three green tools have rates associated with them, and we'll learn more about them. They are called administered rates because the Fed sets them directly. So interest on reserve balances has an interest on reserve balances rate. Overnight reverse repurchase agreement facility has the overnight reverse repurchase agreement facility rate. And the discount window has the discount weight. So interest on reserve balances is the primary tool in the Fed's toolbox. Uh, the interest on reserve balances rate is the interest rate that banks earn from the Fed when they deposit funds in their reserve account. There are two key concepts to remember for understanding and teaching interest on reserve balances. These two key concepts are reservation rate and arbitrage. Let's look at each of these two economic concepts a bit more and show how they allow interest on reserve balances to steer the federal funds rate and other short-term interest rates toward the FOMC's target range for the policy rate. A reservation rate is the lowest rate that banks are willing to accept for lending out their funds. To understand the concept of reservation rate, let's consider what banks do with their excess funds. Like any investor, they seek a return on their money. Here we assume they have three options. They can deposit excess funds at their Federal Reserve Bank and earn the interest on reserve balances rate. They can lend excess funds to other banks in the federal funds market and earn the federal funds rate, or they can invest in treasury bills and earn the treasury bill rate. Now, let's assume interest on reserve balances is offered at a higher rate, 2.5%, than the other two alternatives at 2%. Remember, the banks seek the highest return, holding risk constant on their money. And remember that interest on reserve balances is a risk-free option that is always available. What would this bank do? In this case, banks will deposit their funds at the Fed to earn interest on reserve balances. So point number one is this. Interest on reserve balances is a risk-free investment option for banks. Because they seek the best return for their money, they will not lend or invest for less than they can earn by depositing at the Fed. So interest on reserve balances serves as a reservation rate. So what happens to the other rates? Well, arbitrage causes them to move up. Let's examine arbitrage. The second key concept is arbitrage. Arbitrage is the simultaneous purchase and sale of funds in order to profit from the difference. So let's assume the federal funds market is saying that funds can be traded at 2% and the Fed is saying that banks can deposit and earn interest on reserve balances at 2.5%. Given that scenario, a bank will see an opportunity to earn a profit. How? The bank will see that it can borrow funds in the federal funds market at 2% and deposit those funds at the Fed for 2.5%, earning 50 basis points or half a percentage point on the difference. And of course, this one bank isn't the only one that will see this opportunity to profit. Other banks will also borrow in the federal funds market and deposit at the Fed. The increase in demand will put upward pressure on the federal funds rate and the federal funds rate will rise. This will continue until the federal funds rate has risen to the level the banks no longer see the opportunity to profit. So arbitrage ensures that the federal funds rate does not fall far below the interest on reserve balances rate. What if the federal funds rate is higher than interest on reserve balances? Arbitrage works in this case too, just in reverse. 
banks will again see an opportunity to profit from the difference. In this case, banks will withdraw money from their reserve accounts and lend in the federal funds market to earn a higher rate. As banks respond to this opportunity, the increase in supply of reserves in the federal funds market will result in a lower federal funds rate. In fact, this will continue until banks no longer see the opportunity to profit. Over time, the rates will equalize. In fact, arbitrage is the reason why these short-term rates remain closely linked, and it makes interest on reserve balances an effective tool for guiding the federal funds rate. So the key point here, Arbitrage ensures that the Fed can steer the federal funds rate by adjusting the interest on reserve balances rate. This slide summarizes why interest on reserve balances is the Fed's primary tool for influencing the federal funds rate. The FOMC conducts monetary policy by setting the target range for the federal funds rate. The Fed implements monetary policy by setting the interest on reserve balances rate to adjust the federal funds rate within the target range. When the FOMC raises the target range, the Fed raises the interest on reserve balances rate, which steers the federal funds rate up into the higher range. When the FOMC lowers the target range, the Fed lowers the interest on reserve balances rate, which steers the federal funds rate down into the lower range. Remember, interest on reserve balances is available to banks. The Fed has a second policy tool that works in a similar fashion for other financial institutions. So, as I said, interest on reserve balances is only available to banks and a few other institutions. So the Fed has an overnight reverse repurchase agreement facility that is open to large financial institutions where these institutions can deposit their funds and earn the overnight reverse repurchase agreement rate offered by the Fed. We won't go into the details here, but no, it works just like interest on reserves, but for these other large financial institutions. In other words, the rate sets a reservation rate for these institutions and they can arbitrage. This rate therefore is a supplemental tool. The overnight reverse repurchase agreement rate sets a floor for the federal funds rate and the setting of the overnight reverse repurchase agreement rate helps keep the federal funds rate in the target range. To complete the discussion of the Fed's administered rates, higher up on the figure is the discount rate. The Federal Reserve lends to depository institutions through the discount window to support liquidity and stability in the banking system and support effective implementation of monetary policy. The discount rate tends to be set 50 basis points or half a percentage point above the interest on reserve balances rate. Banks should not be willing to pay more for reserves in the market than the discount rate. As such, the discount rate acts as a ceiling for the federal funds rate. Another tool to mention is open market operations. Before 2008, open market operations was the key tool to make sure the federal funds rate hits the FOMC target when there were limited reserves. But with ample reserves, small movements in the supply curve do not influence the federal funds rate. So open market operations are no longer a key tool. Of course, there are factors outside the control of the Fed that can naturally drain reserves, shifting the supply curve to the left. Over time, the Fed will need to conduct open market operations to purchase securities, which add reserves, and make sure the supply curve stays to the far right region of the figure in that horizontal range. But open market operations do not need to be conducted daily when operating in normal times. Let's see the tools in action. Here you see the Fed raising the federal funds rate by increasing its administered rates. Uh, and if you look closely, you can see that the Fed has, is raising interest on reserve balances, the overnight reverse repurchase agreement rate, and the discount rate all at the same time. And this is steering or pulling the federal funds rate higher. Likewise, uh, the Fed lowers the federal funds rate by decreasing it, its administered rates. And here you see the Fed uh, moving its administered rates down and thereby steering the federal funds rate lower. I'd like you to notice also that in both of these, the supply curve isn't changing at all. Remember, in the old regime, limited reserves, the Fed moved the federal funds rate by shifting that supply curve. In this case, uh, the supply curve is not really in play. The Fed is moving the federal funds rate by shifting its administered rates.
You might also notice that one of the traditional tools, probably one that shows up in your textbook, is not included here, and that's reserve requirements. So with ample reserves in the banking system, reserve requirements uh, don't play a significant role. And as a result, on March 26th of 2020, uh, the Federal Reserve set reserve requirements to zero. And so this is a non-operational tool and is one that you should not include in your instruction. So the Fed's new toolbox includes these tools, interest on reserve balances, overnight reverse repurchase agreement rate, the discount rate, and open market operations. For more information, consult the Teaching the New Tools of Monetary Policy webpage on the St. Louis Fed website. The URL is at the bottom of the page. Thank you and have a great day.